Let's pray. Father, we just bless you today because you're so good and you're so faithful to us. And we just thank you that we get to be part of what you're doing in the earth today. And that uh, because of what you're doing in the earth, that we will see great and mighty things taking place. That, Father, truly this is a time of miracles. That when, uh, when we look one way and we look another direction and we're saying, oh, my God. Oh my, we've got to have some type of breakthrough. Something has to take place and you are there and you show up. And so, Father, we look to you that we will look to none other. That, Father, we will not look to our own strength, and that, but we will look to you because you are our strength and you are the joy of our lives. And so, Father, we just thank you for that. Bless this, uh, this time. Let your word come forth, that which you want us to hear. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that which is not of you. Let it fall to the ground and not be remembered. But that which is from you, may it resonate within us so that we are transformed into the very image and the very bride that you desire us to be. In the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. That, uh, that but the Father is using everything around us so that we are prepared. That we are able to break loose of our our prior because what we had you know you know Fourth of July and apple pie is gone. It, it's just the way it is. But why? Because the Father is calling the bride to be with Him. And if we're too comfortable living in the wilderness, then He's got to shake up the wilderness for us to, to break us loose and out of that. And so He will use uh, He will use events. He will use politics, he will use wars, he will use diseases and pestilences and everything possible until he gets our attention. And and that and so but so going into that, this is what Sukkot is all about. Right? Sukkot is about us, it's a rehearsal, it is uh, it is preparation for the day that's coming. And and so we've talked about here in the last few weeks, uh, remember we we talked about Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. What is that? It is about the bridegroom, the sound of the shofar, and is, is sounding, and the ten virgins awaken, and five are wise and five are not wise. And, and what is it? It's to join the procession of the bridegroom to come to the door. And so there's a procession of ten days, ten days of awesomeness, not ten days of all. Because ten days of all, remember what I was talking about, comes from... The Babylonian religion tradition of Akitu, which is which is um, which is a religious procession of Marduk. Ten days of awe. It's the, it's, the, it's a procession of Marduk, and it was it's called Babylonian assimilation into Judaism. So we differentiate ourselves from it because we're not going to be a people of mixture. But there are ten days of awesomeness from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur. And why why is that? Because the bride has made herself ready during the month of Elul. When I am my beloved's and he is mine. That that's that time that we have gone through. Uh, 30 days of repentance, and we did come to the place that we are ready, that our lamps are trimmed and ready to go on Yom Teruah. So then we're in this procession as the wise virgins going with um, with the procession of the bride, uh, the, the, the groomsmen, to meet the bridegroom on Yom Kippur. And why Yom Kippur is the door, and the door is open, and we go in for the wedding day. And so Yom Kippur is all about being with the bridegroom, to be with him. That door is closed, and the foolish, the unwise uh, virgins come to the door, and they say, let us in. And they say, we don't know who you are. Because the brides, the procession of the virgins, uh, look like Yeshua, like one that Yeshua would want to spend eternity with. But the other ones weren't prepared because they didn't have their garments ready to go. So on Yom Kippur, it is now five days of intimacy with the bridegroom. So five days of intimacy during that time period by which we arrive at Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, where the bridegroom and the bride comes out to join the wedding guests. And they have seven days of celebration of this new wedding, this new marriage that's taken place that, uh, that, that culminates 
in one final day, the eighth grade day, which is the wedding guests go home on the seventh day and the bridegroom says, hey, let's have another special day of intimacy on the eighth great day. So this is what's before us right now, and that's what we're getting ready to celebrate. So we're in a time of intimacy. We're in the time of the rehearsal for the intimacy. These are the times that we've already made our, 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 our gowns ready. They're without spot, without blemish, they're without wrinkles, and we have been adorned by the gifts, the fruit that comes through, through the Holy Spirit. You know, the one that the bridegroom sends to the bride to say, do you need anything? Do you have everything that you need? Hey, I'm bringing these gifts to you so that you are ready and you are prepared to meet the bridegroom. So with that being said, here we have on the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the last of the seven prophetic feasts of, of Yahweh, of Elohim. And as listed in Leviticus 23, it's also called the Feast of Booths. It's also called the Feast of Ingathering. I love that because... We're scattered among the nations, right? We're scattered to, to the four corners of the earth. And that's a metaphorically saying we're scattered everywhere. And, and so the sound of the shofar is called and we're all gathering. We're all coming together um, for this uh, wedding reception after the wedding. And so Leviticus 23, 34 through 36 and verse 41 says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot, for seven days to Yahweh. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and which is a Sabbath rest, and you shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, which is a Sabbath rest, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it, and it shall be a statue forever in your generations. Now I had a question that was posed to me earlier this week, and the question is, um, why do we not have any sacrificial uh, offerings during the feast days? Well, when you look at the scriptures, by the way, and this is just a side note, it's because there is no tabernacle or temple established. And so therefore, there's no place to offer up a burnt offering. There just isn't. And because any other place, according to scripture, is an abomination. Because they set up high places all over the place, uh, and they were offered up to idols, right, to demons. Zechariah, so that's the present. The present has never changed. Leviticus 23 has never changed. You shall do this perpetually and throughout your generations. And then we have Zechariah 14, 17 through 19. This is future. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt shall not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which Yahweh strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So why is it so important? This is really key. Events do not govern Yahweh's feasts. Right? It's the other way around. The feasts were not created because of historical events. You know how many feast days? Fourth of July was created for an historical event. But that's not the way the feast days work, right? It is, it is Yahweh's feast days. And they are governed by his clock and his calendar, right? So what did he do? He gave us the sun, the moon, and the stars to determine when his days will be. And they are fixed as a witness of those days. Okay? So, and we also know that there's a partial fulfillment of Passover uh, through uh, the exodus from Egypt. We see the fulfillment of Yeshua fulfilling the spring feast days. And we also see the fulfillment of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, right? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I believe in, that these still have yet to be fulfilled in their wholeness, their completeness. There's still more to be done. And we also have the fall feast that we are waiting for our bridegroom to arrive, right? So, 
Um, the seven feast days are future revelations. We know this. We talk about them as they are shadows uh, to reveal different things. These are shadows to reveal the temple. These are shadows that reveal the royal priesthood of Yeshua and how these things are to be restored. Okay? So I tell you this, I'm not looking forward to a... Uh, a temple to be built right now in Jerusalem uh, because anything that would be built right now in Jerusalem is going to have a lot of mixture in it because they've already said it's going to be a place where the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians and all that are going to come together and something's off with that. I don't see that within Scripture. But I do see that Yahweh is going to bring His people together and who are we? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So... Um, we don't know how it's all going to come about until it actually arrives. So we look forward to that. But we see different uh, idiomatic, metaphorical expressions within scriptures to show us something that when we peer deep enough into, we're going to see something different. That's why we look at it. That's why we study it. That's why we go into it. Because when we get to looking at the temple, we are going to see... Um, we're going to see who we really are as the bride. And not everybody's the bride. So we've got to keep that in mind. Let me look at something. Uh, Leviticus 23, 41. You shall keep the Feast of Tabernacles as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in your generations. You shall celebrate in the seventh month. As we've been studying out in Deuteronomy, we actually, when you peel back the layers of Deuteronomy, what does it reveal for us? That every believer's position in Yeshua is to be a priest. That's right. And that there are a sequence of events that take place that are part of the preparation of the bride. So everything that we've been talking about here recently is like the bridal procession. But, but what about, you know, we hear it, Yom Kippur is past. Now, what does it mean if we follow the calendar around for the next cycle of things? That perhaps next year will be, no, not a rehearsal, but the real thing, yes. right? So for us to be uh, a priest within his kingdom, part of the royal priesthood, Right? Is that what we're supposed to be part of? Yes. Then that we have to do particular things to undertake that role. The preparation of that um, has to come through. So for this preparation is that there is a promise that has been put within each one of us. And that seed comes through the Abrahamic promise. Now you've heard me talk about the Abrahamic co covenant in the last couple of weeks, how that relates to these fall feast days, the Abrahamic co covenant. We have the Mosaic Covenant, which leads us to the Davidic Covenant. All of these three are layers by which we, we must go through uh, in order to get to the Davidic Covenant. We are in the process of inheriting the... Remember what, uh, what the disciples asked Yeshua in Acts chapter 1, When will you restore your kingdom? And Yeshua responded, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs, or it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Yeah. Only the Father knows. So there's something that's going on that we are to just wait, and we, we, so it's a time of preparation for us to be that royal priesthood. So that we have to have the seed of the word go into the good soil of our lives for it to bring forth the fruit of the kingdom that he's looking for. Okay, think about this. Yeshua gave, gave an example about the, the parable of the people that were given the um, talents. All right? So what did he say with the people of the talents? One was given five, one was given two, and one was given one. The one with five went out and invested those talents, came back with five more to present. The one with the two had two more, made two more talents and had that to present. And then the one who had, had just the one, what did he do? He buried it in the ground. And so we have a responsibility. Now think about this. 
in terms of Hebraic thought and in the bride, that if we the bride is a royal priesthood, if the bride is a people that have prepared themselves for this coming, then what does it look like to Yeshua? That we are a people that is producing fruit. So if the fruit of the word, that's the seed of the word, goes deep inside of us, yeah, I have a, a fly that I'm getting dive bombed over here. Let's say that's that just don't land right here like it did on a prior president. Okay, no. Um, so if that seed is going to go go into good soil, it's going to produce good fruit. That's right. Right? We are to be a people that produces a fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Why? Because when the bridegroom comes, we are going to be a people that are going to say, look, we have been, we have produced much to present to you. Because what happens during the time of the fall feast? And you come to the time of Sukkot, you bring an offering to Yah. If you and where does that where does that offering come from? It comes from the fruit of our lives. And from from that, then those those offerings are accepted. And during different intervals, those offerings are used for different things to supply for the for the Levites, to supply for the poor, to supply for the temple. That's what the, these are brought into, and that's what they're brought in to be used. The temple management is the responsibility of the priesthood. And so in order to get have the temple to operate the way it's supposed to do, then, tithe, then, then the people have to be fruitful to bring a tithe in so it can operate, so it can function, so it's not dysfunctional. A lot of people say, well, tithes aren't for today. Well, I'm going to just tell you this. If the tithes aren't for today, then the body is dysfunctional because the body is a representation of the tabernacle of the temple. It is a representation of the bride. And so for the bride to operate the way she needs to operate, there are functions that take place in order for the maintenance of this thing that's going on in the world today. And that is the beautification of the bride of Messiah. Amen? Okay, so uh, for so we have to reach the potential that Yeshua desires to see his bride to be. If we are a people that are not following the prescription of the priesthood, then then and, and well, what does that look like? What it looks like is it's represented. Let me go to that verse. It's over in Ezekiel. It's actually in this passage here from from uh, Ezekiel forty. Three, forty-two. I hear forty-one, forty-one, forty-one. <laughs> forty. We go forty, 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 forty-one, forty-one. Okay. All right. It's all in this passageway. But uh, so it goes into the details about the. Uh, uh, Y'all can just read. Just read the forties. Okay. <laughs> You can be so prepared for these things, and then it just like it disappears as quickly as my thoughts do. You know. Okay. Sandy's not here to blow my ear to give me a fill up. <laughs> so it washes down with rain and shower. <laughs> yeah, with the hair. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, but but in Ezekiel's temple, we see a future temple that's being built, and but what? But in there, we see that there is a role of the priesthood. And of the Zadok priesthood, and it talks about what the priests are supposed to do. Uh, going into, here it is, Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 15. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray uh, from me, shall come near to me to minister to me, and shall stand before me to offer the fat and the blood, declares the Lord, uh, the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary. They shall come near to my table and minister to me and keep my charge. And, and then it goes on and it gives a description of, of what they're wearing and what they're doing and what their responsibilities are. And in those responsibilities and with what they're wearing is a, is, takes us back to Deuteronomy chapter 14, which starts to tell us about the what is holy and what is not holy. And it goes back to the what we eat and what we don't eat. It talks about what makes us to be a set-apart people and, and a profane people. And, and this is what the priesthood does. So how does that relate to the bride? Well, in our preparation, just like in Esther, uh, what did Hadassah do? 
she was selected to be the bride to the king. Well, in that she did bridal preparations, and she soaked, and she had the prep, and she did the perfumes, and she did all these different things to beautify herself. And then at the very end, she selected the right jewelry, not the gaudiness, not the stuff like the like the whore of Babylon does that puts on all this ornate stuff to draw people's attention to her, but she puts on only that which she knows that the king loves and will be attracted to. Well, that is what the bride is. That in order to be the bride, first thing you have to know is you have to beautify the inside. And I'm talking about not just the spiritual walk that we need to do. That's all part of it by which we, we do want to walk in holiness. We want to study out the scriptures because the scriptures of the Torah is the gospel. That is the gospel by which we learn to walk in the footsteps of Yeshua. That's how we know how to be the bride. And so when we walk into, the, into that bridal procession, we've already got that underneath us. Why are the unwise virgins not there? Because she never, they never learn to walk. In Torah, that's the lifestyle that we're walking in. Well, part of that lifestyle is we're making, so we're making the inside right. So we get the Yeshua piece. That's very important. And he begins the transformation because we're converted in our heart and we turn away from pagan ways. Well, in that process of, stir, stir, uh, of walking out Torah, what's it do? We learn the difference between what the pagan ways are and what, what Yahweh's ways are, right. right? And in that we also learn that our physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we learn what to put in our body and what we don't put in our body. So anybody that says, well, I can, I prayed about it and I can eat pig is absolutely trying to, is absolutely has not read the scripture because it is the gospel. This is the good news. Why would someone who loves us not want us to put um, something bad in our body? Why would he want to put us something bad in our body? If he loves us, he'll say, stay away from that. I didn't create it for your body. Let something else eat that. Like my dog will eat anything. <laughs> and then we pay for it after she eats what she wasn't supposed to eat. Uh, but what does our body do? If we eat what we're not supposed to eat, we pay for it. Maybe we shorten our lives and we don't fulfill the purposes for which y'all called us to. So the preparation of the bride has to do with, with what we, what's clean and what's unclean. It has to do with understanding the role of the priesthood is that once we learn that, we can talk about it. We can share. We can help people to learn how to read labels, right? Because you look at labels and say, no, that came from pig. I don't want to put that in my body. I'm not going to shoot that thing in my arm. I'm not going to do something that's going to poison this temple <laughs> so that because I want to be that which has been purified in body, in mind, in spirit, Holy. right? Holy and set apart for him. So we're not going to put things on our skin. We're not going to, we're not going to have piercings. We're not going to be pulling our hair out. See, this has not come from pulling my hair out, by the way. I just want to let you, to alleviate any question, I did not pull my hair out for any idol, any God, okay? Just so you know, right, Michael? No, I didn't. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you. No. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> no, this is just from Libby. No. <laughs> Maybe it's in the genes. No, um, but nevertheless, we are to be a people that, you know, we're set apart, and that's what makes us the priesthood. Yes. Because in the priesthood is the walking, it's the living, and then it's the telling. Amen. That's what causes the Zadok priesthood to be set apart by which Pincus was called from, right? Yes. Phineas Pincus, he was, and that's where the Zadok priesthood, Zadok, Zedek, the, that holiness, that, the righteous priesthood. So, so that brings us, you know, so that brings us, that's why when you think about the temple, you're not, we're not going to be sacrificing something on the altar that Yahweh would turn his nose up to. But that which is sacrificed to him is that which comes from a contrite and humble heart. Because he didn't he, he didn't require of us burnt offerings. Isn't that what the psalm said? But he had to he put into place something that was a shadow to project that which is to come. Because he is telling us that temple, that tabernacle is just a shadow of the image of the real thing, which is, a, which is the heavenly te temple, the heavenly tabernacle. And what is that? It's Yeshua. 
So we, the tabernacle on earth, represent the tabernacle in heaven, which is Yeshua, who we are going to join and meet. And so we have a witness in heaven, and we have a witness on the earth, and when there's two witnesses, what do you have? You have a thing established. Amen? And so Sukkot brings us to the point of, of wh why it is that the bride gets to go in the right now, the five days of intimacy, which leads us to the great celebration. But you know what happens after the great celebration? Is that, that the, the bridegroom gets up and he dim dismisses every, all that came to celebrate except those that he calls for that special people. And they'll rem rem remain behind and they have a holy convocation. They have a holy meeting. They have a time that that's called the eighth great day. And that eighth great day is when you're counting out in the, in the period of time and over time, if a day is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day, what, what are we, what's being represented? Well, we're at the end of the sixth day, getting ready to go to the seventh day, right. which is, it is talking about seven days, the seven days, you know, there's so many sevens within scripture, but we have, what do we have for Sukkot? Feast of Tabernacles, seven days. Seven days, but then there's the eighth day. And everybody else gets to go home. But on the eighth day, that eighth millennial reign of Yeshua the Messiah, who comes and he's establishing his kingdom, we have set up before us that time where everybody else gets to go home to the nations of the earth. But those that have been that are called to stay and to gather behind will live with Yeshua forever. Hallelujah. Amen. And I think about that and I was like, have you ever, I mean, go back and think about this. In Revelation, it, it shows us the heavenly, um, we see, we see the, um, the new Jerusalem coming down yes. from heaven. Yes. And it's big. And it's, it's like, whoa, that's really cool. You know, you read about the streets of gold, and you see about the layers of the walls, and you see about all these different things, and the 12 gates, and it's like, wow, this seems like a really pretty place to live in. And then you think about living back in Texas, Egypt, Brazil. It just doesn't compare, does it? And, and uh, because there are the nations that will live in other parts of the earth, and if they don't come up to Tabernacle every year to celebrate that time, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, then no rain will fall. They're going to be cursed for a year. It's like, yeah, we better get our act together that every family of the earth needs to send a representative up to Jerusalem. But, I, but, but, I want, but when I think about that, I don't want to be just a wedding guest. Because the wedding guests, if you look at it in the parable of the virgins, the, they're the ones that were knocking on the door saying, you didn't let me in. They were left out. They were left outside. And then what about the, the wedding guests that did get in? And, and then the master of ceremony says, you, you didn't, you're, wearing, you're not wearing wedding clothes. And that person's plucked up and thrown outside. I don't even want to be one of the wedding guests that gets kicked outside. I, I'm telling you, to, to the things that are happening, and we've been told, we've been warned. We've been told in Scripture that we're going to be living in a day and an hour that we're living in right now. We've been told, and many people are out there scoffing and saying, well, when is the time of his coming? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that what Cephas said? Peter? Amen. People would mock us. Do you realize that there's people that are not part of our congregation today because we were talking about the coming of Yeshua and the Messiah and we we're talking about the events and we're showing how current events are aligning with Scripture and how it's all happening. We said, we don't want to hear that anymore. They, and they said, we're just going to go somewhere else. Just give us the fluff. Just give us the stuff. We don't keep Sabbath, you know? Keep the feast days? That's a Jewish thing, isn't it? No, 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 it's a God thing. Is doing Bible things in Bible ways, and that's why we're supposed to do Bible things in Bible ways. I want to share, share something with you. Um, I did see it. I saw it in my notes here. Just a second. Okay. All right. Somewhere in my notes. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so here we go. Um, this is uh, taken from John. It's several passages from, from John. And if you're right, taking notes, you can write this down. It's John 14. Verses uh, 15, 
21, 23 to 24, then John 15, 10 and 14. Now, the reason why these are all pulled out together like this is because there's a theme that when you join them together like this, this is not to mix up the word or cause confusion or to try to, trace, try to say something that's not being said within Scripture, but you see a wonderful, beautiful pattern that's going on here. Thinking about us as a royal priesthood, that, that not only that we get our, we, you know, you get your sea legs on, you know, you know what sea legs are? Anybody that hasn't ever been on a boat, you know that there's a certain period of time that you, it's like you don't walk straight, but then you then pretty soon you're just kind of walking with the waves. And, okay. and then you get on land and have to redo it. And then you get on land, you feel like the land's just moving all the time. Okay. They're like roller skates. Yeah. This, I'm going to read all these together. These are bridal principles. Why are these bridal principles? Because this is what the bride looks like, the royal priesthood looks like. If you love me, keep my commandments. I know you know these verses. But this is Yeshua speaking to his bride. He's speaking to us. If you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Now, I'm going to let's stop right there. He who has my commandments. What is his commandments? His gospel. The gospel is the Torah. Yeah, that which was given to us by Moses that he received on the mountain. Okay? So we got the first five books of, 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 uh, of the Bible right there within the Tanakh. There's first five books. Now, I'm not counting out anything that follows from Joshua all the way to Revelation, anything in between. I'm not counting that out. I'm just saying that which was given us by Moses is the good news. Because it was first delivered to Abraham. And Moses wrote it down for us. So he who keeps my commandments, that is his gospel, his Torah, which is his marriage covenant, but all those three things, they're synonymous. And keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. When does he manifest himself to us? On Yom Kippur, the wedding day. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And by the way, he manifests himself, by the way, when we come to know him. He does manifest to us. Because I don't know about you, but when that revelation comes, like, oh my goodness, why did I ever live a lifestyle like that before? Amen. That time where you come, it's that come to Jesus meeting. No, seriously, it's a come to Yeshua meeting and he shows himself and our hearts melt and we're like, oh my goodness, you're so awesome. Okay, and then it says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him and he does not love me, does not keep my words. Okay, so our apostolic brethren, those that are New Testament only type of people, if we don't, what are his words? His words, that which was given at the beginning. Now, well, that doesn't apply to me today. Well, then they don't love him. They, 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 do, they fail to see because there's still scales over, his eye, over their eyes. And it says, if you, keep, um, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. In other words, we're going to stay there. We're going to live with him. We're in the five days of intimacy, Yay. abiding with him, dwelling with him. Yeah. Just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Hey, he said, here's my scepter, you go do it or you get whacked. No, it's because we saw like, oh, you love you. We love him because he first loved us. What do you want me to do? What do you want? I know you guys know this, but it's nice to hear a refreshing on this, isn't it? Yeah. To hear what he's really wanting to do. Here's, here's another way to say it. Psalm 119, 97, 1 through 104. Uh, Psalm 119, 97 through 104. Oh, how I love your Torah. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. Oh, you, through your commandments, make me a wise virgin. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Does that sound like the, that, that which was just somebody that was 
an outcast has now is now becoming the bride, yeah. being elevated to be the rightful partner for Yeshua the Messiah. I understand more than the ancients because I kept your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, like the foolish bride, or the foolish, um, the foolish um, virgins. That I may keep your word, keep, keep, was keep to guard, shamar, to guard, to protect, to 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 uh, watch over, to listen, to hear everything, right? I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. And get this. This should take you over to the Psalm of Solomon. How sweet are your words to my taste. What are the words? The gospel, the Torah, those words that were given on the mountain, at the bridal, the time of the marriage, you know, that took place in, in Exodus chapter 19. Um, your words to my taste sweeter than honey to my mouth though your precepts i get understanding or through your precepts i get understanding therefore i hate every false way that is the wise virgin they didn't they it's like but okay think about it this way that we know that the law of god is supreme it yes. rules over all and from our understanding from a Hebraic perspective we understand that the law is the Torah it's the instructions of God that which gives us the words of life okay but we also understand that that the physical realm like there's a physical body that there are Yahweh's laws that govern and pros and that that uh, that that govern all of what how things work think about this if you've gotten in a car to get over here today then that those cars worked because there was a process that respect God's law. If you've ever been on an airplane, you, it's because there was a process that observed the law of thermal, not thermal, aer, of aerodynamics, right? It, because they understand the lift and, and what it takes to put an airline, airplane up in the air. And they respected those laws. But, and somehow or another, we know that just innately growing up, if you drop something on the floor, you see that the law of gravity has taken place. It's not floating. It's not going off some other direction. You know that something's in place that keeps us grounded. And that for some reason that there's a blindness over the people's eyes, yep. that they can't understand that the same laws that cannot be changed in physics, that somehow or another that the laws of God can be changed and twisted to, to say, well, that doesn't really apply to me today. Nope. Does that make sense to you? No. Nope. But that's why we are a royal priesthood in order to speak forth the words of life to show that all of the laws of God do apply to our lives. Amen. And so, uh, so this is where where um, we've had all these things uh, from the very beginning that we want to walk in. Now, okay, I want to go back and talk about. No, I think we're about done. All right. There's so much more. There's so much more to talk about, to study out, that I wanted to share with you today. But what I want to, to sh more than anything, is to is is to bring out the point that we, as the bride, have this tremendous role to play. Here it is that I was looking for. It's Ezekiel 43:10 through 12. This is in the King James version. And it says this, and we'll, we'll finish up with this. Because the priestly role is what gets us to Sukkot. It's what gets us to be able to celebrate that time. But it not only gets us to those seven days of Sukkot, it gets us to the eighth great day. Okay? Son of man. Think about that. Son of man. Think bride. Son of man. Show the house. So what's the house? which is his heavenly tabernacle, which represents Yahweh's kingdom principles and plan, his house. Okay, we're not talking about a structure. This is how, you know, we've been taught that that it's a, uh, it's not about a structure. That's Greek thinking from the beginning, Bereshit. It's about the house is not about a building. It's about a family. It's about a family. Yes. So... Show the house. Show them what my family looks like. 
It's going to be represented in the tabernacle. It's going to be, it's going to, sh it's, it's put together based on my principles. You know, the different laws that are immutable, they can't be changed, right? Like the law of thermodynamics. In this world, if you set something outside long enough, it's going to rust and fall apart. That's the law of thermodynamics. These are principles, they're plans that Yahweh put into place. Okay, son of man, right? Show the house to the house of Israel. The house of Israel, Yeshua said, I came not but for the lost um, sheep of the house of Israel. And it says that they, the priests, the bride, may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. Let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house. What's the heavenly house? Yeshua. Show them what Yeshua looked like. How do we know what Yeshua looks like? We read the first five books. That's why we study it out. We're getting ready to restart the cycle here in a couple weeks. And the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof, and the and write in it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. This is the law of the house. This is the law of the family. This is the law of the priesthood. This is the law of the bride. This is these are the instructions that were given to us so that the tabernacle, we, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh, when we all not only individually, but we as a family, as a Mishpacha, all rightly fit together like living stones form a tabernacle. That is the tabernacle that he's talking about. So that we are all coming together. And it says that this law of the house upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about, shall be most holy. Behold, this is the Torah of the house. Isn't that beautiful? When it's talking about this, where, where this is through this contract, this covenant that Yeshua gave, when he poured out his blood and it ran down and it ran down and it purified it, us. Honestly, that's what it, what it did. It allowed us, therefore, to be able to enter into this covenant. When he died, what happened? All heaven and earth shook. It shook the graves. The people rose up from the dead. People walked the streets of Jerusalem. Don't you think that there's a time coming when Yeshua comes once again? I mentioned this last week. That when, the, when, when he sets his foot down and he arrives, that the graves are going to shake loose. That people are going to rise. They're going to be walking all over. We're going to be joining together with him. Don't you think that, that the bride, whether they're, they're dead or they're alive, that we are all going to be coming together as one, a beautiful bride, one that's made herself beautiful. Because we can't think about this. All of the witnesses of the past, they're up in the stadiums of heaven, they're cheering us on. They, each one of them lived out Torah, wherever they might be, you know, wherever the, uh, that, that takes place. Are they not cheering us on, saying that we are living this out? We did it, you can do it. They first faced persecution. We can face persecution. They had trials that caused them to grow in great faith, that they made it in that, that hall of faith. Then we can live in that same place. Isn't, isn't that why that, uh, that we're told in Jeremiah that the people um, of, of the past that lived through the first exodus will be coming to us and they're saying, tell us, forget about what happened then. Tell us how you did it. Tell us how you walked through it. Tell us how this took place. How does it take place? It's because the Ruach HaKodesh brought to us the great anointing that we needed to walk through it. See, this. what is it about the book of Acts? Was that just stuck in there for us just to say, oh, that was nice during those days? No, it's because, because we are to be a bride that we are going to be walking in the fullness of the time of miracles that show forth that we're connected to the right bridegroom. We're not tied to some false bridegroom that looks all right and looks like Yeshua. No, there were two Yeshuas. There was a bar, there was, there was two that looked alike according to uh, according to what they wrote. One was that bar, what was his name? Bar? Barnabas. 
no, bar, bar Jesus, right? And then there was Yeshua. And they said, who do you want us to release on that day of Passover? Right, who do you want us to... Bar, bar Sabbath, okay. Yeah, who do you want us to release? Yeah, the son of our father, right? Okay, the son of the father or Yeshua, the right, the son of the living God. Okay, we'll get it, right? Okay, so who is that? You know, do we want a fake? Or we want the real thing? And so how do we even know that we're following the real thing other than that we've read the prescription that we need to get us there? Right? And so, and, and how do we know that we are the ones that are walking in that? Because I'm going to tell you what, there's some 35,000 denominations thinking they're following the right Yeshua. But for some reason, 35,000 other denominations think that you worship on a different day or every day. Or you don't have to do the feast days because that was done away with. And you then, you know, why then, that, that, then they're following a different Yeshua in my book. But, but when we follow Yeshua and we're walking in the paths of righteousness and he is ordaining us, he is appointing us, he, uh, he's putting his ornaments upon us, one of his, his or ornaments, it's those gifts. Those gifts. It says that, that, that according to the book of Acts is that they went out and they preached the word with signs following. Well, what word did they preach? They, told, they, they preached the Torah. But signs followed. I want to ask you this. Are signs following us? Are signs following us? Are we living in a time of miracles? Do we see miracles following us wherever we go where people say, wait a minute, stop. That person's different. Or, or wait a minute, it's like you walk into a place and there's all this cursing going on. They say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. And they don't know you from any other man or woman on the street. It's because there's a presence of the living God that's on us, that needs to be on us. So when we go into a room, the atmosphere changes. That's what the bride does because when Yeshua came down the street, things changed. When Peter walked down the street, his shadow fell on somebody and they got up and walked. I mean, think about this. What is the bride of Messiah looking like? Do we look like it? Well, guess what? I think we're entering into a time we say, whoa, the mountains may fall. There could be a tsunami that's coming in our direction. But guess what? Maybe we should be a people that just holds up our hands and say, not on my watch. I don't know. You know, Yah's will will be Yah's will. But we can say, when we can tell people and say, whoa. There's something that's going to be happening 24 hours. We call up our loved ones and say, it's time for you to leave the beach. All right. It's just time to, now why don't you get on the road right now, fill up your tank and just go. we got a place for you to stay. We're in, you know, we're up here. We're at 3,000 feet, 3,500 feet in the, in the Texas panhandle. I think we're above the water level. Okay. All right. So this should be a season of our joy. This should be the season that we're really saying, Woo, we had put in, we went out there, we were sowing seeds, we were telling people the good news that this putting in and whatever ground would take it. And and then we bring forth, there's a harvest that's coming in, the threshing floor is full, and we're beating it out, and all that chaff and all the tares and all that stuff is getting separated, and we're bringing in a harvest. We're going to the we're going to the wine press. We've like, man, we've got some grapes today. And we're treading out the, the the graves, and we've got a we've got wine to take with us to yes. Sukkot. You know, we're we're just ready, and we're just going to have a good time. All right. No, I'm saying that that this is what the season of our joy is about. This is what Sukkot's all about. You know, we can go in and so I mean, I'm telling you, I had a lot of good stuff I wanted to share with you, but I just want you to know we should be excited. Hey. And if and if I'm telling you, if okay, say so, well. Uh, we can't go up to Lake Paladura with you guys. This Well, if you can't go up there, okay, make sure this week that's coming up is special. Yeah. Right? That it is a time that we can say, oh, Father, we're going to get into these sukkahs. The sukkahs. 
These temporary shelters that represent this temporary body that we're going to say, this thing may get blown down in the wind of the panhandle of Texas, but you know, so might my body, but I've got a glorified body that's coming. I'm going to get something that's new. I'm going to get something that's got some new clothes on it. I'm going to get something that, that's going to smell good for once. I'm not going to go through my deodorant in two hours because it's all hot outside. No, I'm going to be looking good. I'm going to be smelling good. And I'm going to be, oh, and I've got, I've got signs and wonders following me, you know? All right. And, it's, and the wrinkles are gone. No more collagen. No more. What? But Botox. I was going to say Botox. We're not going to put any of that stuff in our body anymore. We don't need that. <laughs> no more implants. <laughs> Wherever they might be, or I don't know. <laughs> oh, we digress. Hallelujah for a glorified body. Amen. No more t hours at the gym. How about that? Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. I better stop before I get myself in more trouble around here. Let's stand up and let's pray. Father, we just bless you today. We thank you for the days of intimacy. We thank you, Father, for the for the rehearsal of, of the wedding, the procession, the the, the, the the wedding day for all of that. We're going to practice what it means to celebrate now. And so, Father, we're just so grateful that we get to be part of that. When you called us, you opened up our eyes. Just like Paul had the scales removed from his eyes, and he knew exactly when the scriptures came together for him, and he understood, and then you started doing wonderful things in his life. And, Father, so much that you're doing that for us. Open up our eyes. Let us see. Let us experience. Let us experience the joy uh, of the season. That, that you called us to. Father, we bless you and we honor you today. Fill us now with your spirit. Let signs and wonders follow us. And that, Father, let your light shine through us. That we reflect your glory so that, that there is truly a light on this earth where there's gross, gross darkness. And it's you and your body that is being exemplified to show your great glory. In the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.